Well, this is not the score Team USA was hoping for. 17 seconds left. Olympic men's basketball, Group A. France, 79. USA, 74. You see uh, Rudy Gobert and Evan Fournier leading the way for France. I mean, Team USA has had its issues in yes. qualifying or leading up to this. France also won in... Let's do that. So let's now take a look at some of the numbers. Ashley Brewer, Jay Harris, welcome into Sports Center. Current score right now, 79-74. There is 17 seconds left in the game. And as Jay said, 28 points with Evan Fournier leading the way. Rudy Gobert chipping in 12. I mean, but I think the real problem here is when you look at USA, Bam Adebayo with a team leading 12 points. Kevin Durant with 10. And uh, Drew Holiday doing his part with 18. We now welcome in NBA analyst Tim Legler. Tim. Shocking. I don't know if you have the words because we don't, but what is the biggest problem for what you're watching right now with Team USA? Well, there's a few things here. Let's start with the fact that, first of all, basketball is a sport that requires a lot of timing, cohesion, role definition, very important part of basketball. And when you take a team and sort of throw it together, you have guys you know, joining the team really without even practicing with these guys, and now they're part of your rotation. It's just very difficult to be able to find that sort of rhythm offensively. You also don't have great role definition on this team because you end up trying to close the game with five guys who are used to being the primary scoring option for their teams. That makes it difficult. You contrast that with what France is running out there, which, look, they've got some NBA players on their roster, Rudy Gobert, Evan Fournier at the top of that list, but they also have great role definition. There was no question Evan Fournier was the focal point for them offensively. That's the way typical basketball teams work. So they clearly had a focus on where they were going with the ball the entire day. And then you have guys running the show at the point. You've got some big guys setting screens. You've got guys on the glass. You've got guys out there to defend. But Evan Fournier was the guy that was the focal point offensively. For Team USA, you don't really know. It's sort of a my turn, your turn type of philosophy offensively. And when the talent discrepancy is not nearly as great as it used to be, you're going to run into some problems when you play against a team that's got some NBA players on it and they have all of those qualities that I discussed with a basketball team. So we have a final score, 83-76. The U.S. men fall in their first game of the Olympics to France. But they have another game on their slate Wednesday against Iran. What can you tell us about how this team can get together, figure out those moving parts, and improve moving forward? Well, look, one of the things they have going for them, obviously, they, it was going to rely on. They've got more talent than any team, obviously, in the Olympics. But each and every day, they're going to get better the longer they're together. So this is certainly not the way you wanted to start this out. And I think you know, they're going to say all the right things afterwards about, hey, you know, the world is caught up and these teams have NBA players on them. I get it. But they're, they're so much more talented if they had more time together collectively the entire group I don't think you're going to see this result today so they're going to get better each and every game in this tournament um, this in a lot of ways could be a good thing for them it could be a wake-up call and make them understand the attention to detail that you have to have their defense the first six minutes of the fourth quarter was really the only sustained spurt of desperation that I saw out of Team USA and that's when they jumped out and built a big lead the problem was they couldn't close the deal because they fell in love with the three-point shot down the stretch of this game. And France did a great job executing, getting the ball where they needed to. So they weren't able to close the deal. But I do think they're going to get better each and every day that they are together. So that's the good news for them. Uh, let's see what they can learn from this because they should feel a sense of embarrassment about this. I don't care who you're playing. If you're Team USA, you're expected to win the gold medal. There should be a sense of embarrassment about the loss. And hopefully that requires them to dig a little bit deeper on both ends of the floor as they go forward. Hey, Tim, this is Jay. Uh, this team was put together with this game in mind because Rudy Gobert just destroyed them inside last time they played. They put together this team with a whole lot of shooters. They were going to three-point them to death. If this team can't shoot threes and make perimeter shots, what then? Well, it's gonna be, they're going to have to rely on their defense. I've always felt Team USA, for the most part, ever since the original Dream Team in 1992, when we put pro players in this, their defense is really what can separate them. No one can match their quickness, their length, their ability to help and recover, to close out to the three-point line, to get back in transition. 
No team can compare to Team USA athletically. And ultimately, that is where they're going to have to rest. And, and sometimes that's difficult when you put together basically an all-star team. You have so many guys that are so used to being the primary scoring option that understanding that you might have to go four or five minutes and not get a great touch, but you still have to go down the other end and dig into people defensively. Sometimes these guys aren't used to that concept. And that is something they're going to have to learn because you look at the balance that Team USA had, and balance isn't always a great thing, Jay. We talk about it a lot in basketball. It's not always a great thing because I think sometimes it indicates you don't know necessarily what the pecking order is offensively. That's what normal basketball looks like. Any team put together that's not an all-star team, you have a pecking order. Option A, B, and C, start with that, and then everybody else fills in a role. That's not necessarily the case with a team like this. They've got to sort through all of those things and see who is going to be the focal point, particularly in tight situations. If you go and take a look at the last four or five minutes of this game, everything was a desperation three-point shot. It seemed like they forgot that there's a mid-range, there's an ability to beat people off the dribble and get to the rim. Uh, they, they fell in love with that three, and ultimately it cost them because nobody re was really in rhythm when you have that kind of balance. It's just a handful of shots for each guy. Contrast that with Evan Fournier in France. I mean, that guy had the ball in his hands the entire game. He got into a rhythm, and as a result, USA loses their first game. I mean, as you look at the numbers right there, Devin Booker, four points. Of course, these guys, some of them coming fresh off the plane from the NBA Finals. We saw him putting up 40 points in the Finals. So you have to think this is a wake-up call. Maybe they just needed a little kick to get things going. Uh, we saw that with Team USA in the women's soccer, and they came back one game two, six to one. So we'll have much more later. We're going to follow this. Brian Windhorst is going to stop by. But Tim Legler, thanks for breaking it down with us. We appreciate it. Thank you. What they want. As we turn our eyes towards football, we have one of the best receivers in the game, Adam Thielen of the Minnesota Vikings, joining us later. But we start the show with CP3. Just recently losing in game six of the NBA Finals, and already the speculation has begun on his future. Our colleague Mark Spears is saying that. None other than the Los Angeles Lakers are interested in CP3 services. Jalen, what do you think about this report? Spears the OG. Here's what I think about this report. This offseason, there are going to be so many players tied to the Los Angeles Lakers. Here we go again. You have story franchise, however, that always is trying to knock on the door and see how they can improve their team to win a championship for right now. This is why they have 17, in particular in LeBron's 17th season and Anthony Davis returning from injury. They're in win-now mode. So therefore, since the offseason is here and they need a point guard, since Dennis Schroeder is a free agent and they may not and are not going to pay his ticket, Chris Paul is going to be in the conversation. Russell Westbrook is going to be in the conversation. People are going to put Dame in the conversation. What's going to happen with Lonzo Ball? We're going to continue to speculate what they're going to do at that spot until it gets filled. But I got some math for you. CP3 is standing to make 44 U.S. American dollars from the Phoenix Suns next year if he doesn't opt out. If he ends up with the Los there. Angeles Lakers without a trade, basically, He'll make $9 million. So that math tells me, if I'm CP3, I'm staying in Phoenix. Yeah, it's a $35 million difference. However, there could be a sign and trade situation or something like that. Now, if you were CP3, would you opt out and then re-sign with Phoenix on like a three-year deal or something like that? Get you $100 million. $44 million in one season is a lot to opt out of, mm. okay? Like, you want to extend that. And or if they're going to rip it up and give you another three, four years, you obviously want that. But to me, his best opportunity right now to probably maximize not only getting his money, but also what he's built with the Phoenix Suns. For a Hall of Famer that's accomplished so much, Chris Paul has been to a couple of squads these last couple of years having to reinvent himself. So now that he's done that and led the Phoenix Suns to the NBA Finals for the first time since 1993, I would hate to see all of that equity he built up 
with his relationship with Monty and Devin Booker and helping the young fellas develop like Aiden and Bridges and both of the cams and Jordan and Payne and then leave that? I would, I would anticipate that he's going to try to do what he can to stay there. I hope that's what he ends up doing for the game of basketball. He's never going to call me and ask, but if I were him, I would opt in for that $44 million in one year, <laughs> see how it goes next year with the Suns. I still feel like he's got a few more years left in him and then hit free agency after that. Now, Jalen, you hinted at it earlier, but you'll never believe this. Our next topic is about another superstar headed to the Los Angeles Lakers. In that same report, Mark Spears said that this could be a potential deal that would bring none other than the triple-double machine, Russell Westbrook, to Los Angeles.